Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. I am Renee Lewis, the director of CE with DBM 360, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Shadi Arufi. I see I'm gonna get it. Arufi. Arufi. Everyone say it three times. Dr. Shadi Arufi. <laughs> got it, got it. Got it. Uh, obviously with our um, presentation today, Pyamnitra, sponsored by PRN. Uh, so I'm gonna call you Shadi, it's so much easier. <laughs> He's board certified in small animal surgery and diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Surgeon, as well as a published author and speaker. Formerly, he practiced as a surgeon for 10 years, including performing specialty surgeries across the US, and then became the chief of surgery at United Veterinary Specialty in Emergency in Silicon Valley. He's also worked with True Care Vets for Pets in LA as a chief of specialty, where he was instrumental and morphing the after hours and weekend emergency hospital to a very successful 24 seven emergency and multi-specialty veterinary hospital. In 2020, he changed gears, founded Vet Triage, a novel and state-of-the-art means of reaching concerned pet owners and their ill pets worldwide, where he currently serves as the chief medical officer. So, welcome. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks for, uh, for joining us in this, uh, hopefully something that you guys manage, manage frequently, so it should be interesting. Um, at any point during this, feel free to ask questions or you know, if you have a different opinion on something, some of this stuff could be quite subjective, so just let me, let me know. The, everything's fair game. So I, I graduated from Cornell in 06, I uh, did two surgery internships at Long Island Veterinary Specialist after my general internship at Angel and then surgery residency at Long Island Veterinary Specialist after almost 10 years at LIDS. I uh, practiced in Las Vegas for, for about a, almost a year, and then Silicon Valley for about a year, um, then LA, about a year and a half there, and then started that triage, which is what I currently, currently uh, I do. So we're going to go through all these different categories for Pi and Mitra. We'll talk about the uh, incidence of the disease, signalment, pathophys, uh, bacterial components of it, how it affects multiple organs in the body, especially the kidneys, clinical signs, physical exam, how you diagnose them, and then what you can do for treatment options, both medical uh, and surgical, and we'll talk about the, uh, the outcomes and prognosis associated with that as, as well. There is a lot to this disease in the literature. We're going to go over kind of more of the uh, sort of clinical aspects, more practical aspects to it, but there's a whole bunch of literature on pyometria because it is such a systemic disorder. So the technical term for it is cystic endometrial hyperplasia pyometria complex. And um, obviously, we always we show it for pyometra, and that just that just speaks to the complexity of the pathogenesis of this disease. The incidence: nineteen to twenty-five um, percent of intact female dogs are affected by ten years of age. We will, of course, focus this this talk on canines, although pyometra can happen in felines, but nowhere near as common. Uh, it affects ninety percent of all intact females, and it can occur pretty much any any age. Um, it runs the gamut. Usually they're about you know, young to middle age dogs that are affected. They typically will have their last heat cycle, I find between four and eight weeks. The literature says about eight weeks before uh, clinical signs develop of the disease. And usually these are, these are intact females that have never had, never had a litter before. Now, when you look at the pathophysiology, um, most of us probably don't give a lot of thought to this. We're thinking, well, you know, it's hormonal disease, so what else is there to talk about? In the literature, there are several other hypotheses as far as what can cause this condition, none of which are fairly strong hypotheses, but you know, they're out there. So for example, the dietary aspect, they were looking at comparing processed dog food versus raw, and they found, oh wow, look, there's less uh, E. coli in the raw food. So, you know, and because E. coli is such a prevalent bacterial a component to this disease, you wonder is there an association there? Uh, who, who, who knows? Uh, genetics, uh, there's one paper looking at golden retrievers and they found an aberration on a chromosome that showed they were about 3.3 times the risk uh, for, uh, for this condition, so maybe there's a genetic component to it. Anything associated with an open service, whether it's postpartum or due to manipulations from like a uh, dystocia or what have you, can predispose the, the, the dog to pyometra. They have retained uh, fetal tissue, retained placental tissue, that'll predispose them to infection. And um, number one, of course, is hormonal, obviously. And so typically it's going to be some sort of a uh, relationship with either estrogen or progesterone. It's either going to be something like uh, 
um, an excessive uh, exposure to these drugs or an imbalance, sorry, hormones, or an imbalance of these hormones, or the patient has an exaggerated response to these hormones. So it's, you may not know this, in clinically speaking, but this is, this is what the, the studies have, have shown. And it typically happens usually during diesterous, although it could happen during the luteal phase as well, um, and then pregnancy or, or um, around the uh, time of pregnancy can also predispose these dogs to pyometra um, because of a variety of, of, of uh, components, but usually a hindrance in their natural defenses to, to ward the infection away. Another thing that also you may not be aware of either, because clinically it may not matter as much, we actually do categorize pyometra in terms of types. And to some, to some degree, really, these are more like stages, because it's supposed to pretty much happen from, from type one to type four, stage one to stage four, but you start off with the cystic components, so the, the endometrium has all these, these uh, thin-walled cysts that develop, again, presumably due to hormonal imbalances or exaggerated response to hormones. And then that will progress over to, um, to uh, um, changes to the cervix due to progesterone as, as type two. Um, type three is where the inflammation starts. And that's where, sorry, it's cutting off here, but that's where the clinical signs develop. So an infiltration of plasma cells, I've been told these are plasma cells, will start to cause inflammation and then the clinical signs associated with, with pyometra. And then finally, what we, what we usually will end up seeing is either an open or closed infection, so chronic endometritis. I'm not sure how they define chronic in terms of timeline, but these are the types of pyometra that we see, which is typically the progression of development anyway. We, as practitioners, are not really going to noti be notified of this in a patient until probably type, type three or type four, but just to make you aware. And then if you wanted to go even further, you can, you can subcategorize these into, into you know, like 3A or 3B. So A is an open cervix, which is seen in the vast majority of cases, and then closed cervix is less common as type B. The, um, the interesting part about pyometra, again, is how it, it can be a systemic disease. And uh, we see you know, changes associated with these pet parameters on your typical uh, you know, temperature checks and heart rates and what have you that are consistent with systemic inflammatory response syndrome, to SIRS, and this is just a table showing in, in cats and dogs and in people what the criteria for, for SIRS is. You know, you could, you could apply these, these standards to lots of diseases, not just pyometra, right? SIRS is a, is a non-specific inflammatory response of the body to a condition, but uh, it's just interesting to note that we don't, we don't tend to think clinically of, of pyometra as being a systemic illness, but it certainly has, a, if, if you base that on, on a chart like this, using such a criteria. We know E. coli is in all of these infections. In fact, if you have a, a, uh, a pyometra case with more than one bacterial infection, 100% of the time, E. coli will be part of that group of multiple bacteria. It, it's always there. There's a variety of other bacteria that are involved, but E. coli is always there. And um, uh, the E. coli themselves, again, in, the, in papers, have dived deeply into all the different factors, virulence and pathogenic factors of E. coli that make it so nasty when it comes to pyometra. Those are things that are beyond sort of clinical perspective of it, but just, you know, E. coli is, is the, main, the main character here, and of course your classic pyometra here, fluid-filled, uh, distended. Um, and uh, this slide is, is to talk about um, uh, peritonitis. So I, as a surgeon, I, I tend to not see that much peritonitis with pyometras, um, and, uh, but if you do think about uh, peritonitis, typically with your, with your gram-negative bacteria, that those typically are uh, peritonitis that are secondary to something else. So pyometra would be a great example of that. Let's say if the uterine wall ruptures or what have you, or just, just translocation through the, through the mucosa. But um, gram-positive uh, bacteria are usually implemented in primary peritonitis. So they are the, they are the, the cause of the peritonitis, whereas the, the gram-negative tend to be a secondary component to some other insult. What that means to us in, in the case of pyometra clinically, probably not much. Just, uh, you know, it, we tend to see more gram negatives, of course, with, you know, E. coli being gram negative. Um, and gram positive tend to be much nastier anyway, but also much less common. So I don't see too much, too many uh, cases of, of peritonitis in, in, these, in these dogs, but just so you're aware of it. So a whole host of factors that make these bacteria fairly nasty, it all results 
it's all it's all tied into uh, lipopolysaccharides, the LPS, um, part of the part of the gram negative um, bacteria cell wall, and uh, that's that's a lot of the uh, the trigger for the intense immune response and damage to organs, also known as endotoxin. So just just be aware of that. When you when you look at the uh, organs that are affected by the bacteria as well as the um, antibody immune complex deposition, it's liver and kidneys. I will frequently, when I talk to clients about pyometra, warn them about the kidneys primarily. I don't see too many hepatic insults with, with pyometra cases. And if, if they do have elevated liver values preoperatively, I expect those values to normalize over the next following weeks. But the kidney changes are what I'm looking for. A lot of times these dogs will come in with um, uh, azotemia, up, it's up to us whether it's the size pre-renal, renal, or post-renal, or a combination, but they'll have azotemia, and then you're hoping that's gonna correct post-operatively as, uh, as you treat these dogs, not just with surgery, but also with everything else they need for, for support. So, so uh, immune complex deposition is, is a problem um, in, in uh, liver and kidneys, but again, that's also not unique to pyometra. That's many other diseases that cause systemic inflammation. So renal changes are, are a big one, and um, part of the reason probably why these dogs do have PUPD leading up to, uh, leading up to the pyometra. Um, we'll go over clinical signs in a bit, but the, the, uh, the renal changes from um, endotoxin or LPS and then the immune complex uh, deposition, those are, those are uh, reasons for the PD changes. I do warn pet owners, um, especially with older pyometras, we don't know whether or not any evidence of uh, renal damage or acute kidney injury will be permanent or not in those dogs. They have to be aware of that prior to surgery. I, I tend to like, I tend to keep these dogs in the hospital till azotemia is resolved, which is typically 24 to 48 hours post-op, but I always warn owners that there it may, be, may be permanent damage to the kidneys. So PUPD is a big one. Typically they'll have, they'll have PUPD from um, at some point between their last heat and when they present, so within that three to eight weeks mark is usually when I see it. So right off the bat with an intact female that just had a heat about, about uh, four to eight weeks ago, who has PUPD, whether it's, whether it's vaginal discharge or not, I'm already thinking pyometra, just based on that, on that history and signalment. And of course, someone can be very ill with you know, vomiting, lethargy, diarrhea, all the, all the standard, standard clinical signs. Obviously, your your you know most teeth are open, and so you're hoping to see that disgusting vaginal discharge in these dogs, which sort of you know seals the deal as much as you can prior to diagnostics that this is actually a pyometra and not not anything else. Um, keeping in mind, of course, too, you know ovarian remnant syndrome, although not common, I tend to see a lot more of them because I'm the one who's repairing those those dogs. But uh, in, especially in large breed dogs that were spayed at some point in the past, maybe uh, spayed either inappropriately or it was difficult for the practitioner to spay them or whatever, some sketchy history. And the uh, uh, ovarian tissue is, is remaining, obviously ovarian remnant syndrome. Don't, don't rule out pyometra in those dogs either. It takes more investigation. Those are more of a, of a pain for us to diagnose, but it's still on the table, especially when you have all the other clinical signs associated with pyometra. Um, radiographs tend to be our first tool, you know, um, uh, most practitioners have ability to collect radiographs and so you're looking for a classic, you know, large uh, tubular soft tissue filled structures in the, uh, the caudal and ventral portion of the abdomen on a lateral radiograph and then on a, on a VD view on both sides here in the abdominal gutters and so that's classic. Um, you don't always get the classic signs and, and you don't have, to have a pyometra that's, that's severely distended with fluid either, right? They can be fairly small pyometras as well. So they won't show up so so uh, obviously on on uh, radiographs, but this is just your, your classical sign. You know, ultrasound. If you're lucky to have ultrasound, or at least have a machine that's not a great machine, but good enough for pyometras. For example, when I was an intern, we had that you know uh, an ultrasound machine that was pretty crappy, and so it was good enough for this. You know, I'm basically I call it a double bladder. You know, I'm looking for urinary bladder, and then there's another fluid filled structure by the bladder. I'm like, ah, pyometra, that's it, I got it. You know, history, clinical signs, and now this, you know, a crappy ultrasound image really shows you that there's, there's not much else that's in that area of the urinary bladder that with that signalment in history, it's gonna cause pyometra. So, um, so, so useful there to help confirm it. And uh, this is showing, yeah, that at the level of the kidneys, uh, the urine filled up form. Um, how many folks here have cut pyometras? Or just, yeah, 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 yeah. And then do you also find that the that they had their heats about a month or two prior? Yeah, okay, yeah. 
So we're going to talk about uh, treatments. Now, um, there's a whole, I have a lot of slides on medical only because it's not very commonly used. I've never used medical treatment except for cases where clients have severe financial concerns. And even in those, even in those cases, I'm pretty much using antibiotics and, you know, fingers crossed. I'm not really going into hormonal therapy with them, but in, um, in my years of giving this, this talk, there's a ton of literature on medical therapy for, for these dogs, so we'll go into that. But I wanna make it very clear, of course, that surgery is the recommendation. Spay them, that's it. But uh, you know, if you happen to have a case, um, uh, either in your past or in your future, where a medical manager might be what the owner wants, then sure, you know, it, it is, it's not like it's unethical to do so. Yes? And then if that's true of open and closed cryos, it, it, so we're, we're going to go through the, the criteria right now because yeah, because ideally, ideally it would be the open pile that if you're going to medically manage it, that would be the one. Yeah. Um, but one of the hallmarks that your medical therapy is working if you're treating a closed pyometra that it turns into an open pyo. Okay. So if that cervix can open up, then and, you know on medical therapy, then you're thinking, oh, okay, it's working, great. So you usually want to see. Um, that open pyometra occur within, I think it says, the literature said three to seven days after you start treatment for closed pyometra with medical management. So it's one of your signs that things are moving forward. But yes, in the ideal world, if you're gonna perform medical therapy on these dogs, then this is your, your criteria of, of what you consider for a, uh, a uh, patient that, that would be appropriate to do so. So maybe there's a value of a breeding dog, healthy patient otherwise, they are young, they've got an open pyo, they've got normal kidneys, um, or on kind of flip side of things, maybe the patient is just not ideal for anesthesia, maybe the client can't afford it or they just prefer not to pursue surgery, um, or maybe you're using medical management for preoperative stabilization. I mean, this I perform all the time, but it's usually in the hospital and the same day as the surgery, typically, unless they're, they're really, really ill, really unstable, and I, and, I, and, and, and I have a conversation with the owner about here are the pros and cons of stabilizing this dog overnight and then surgery tomorrow, you know, those are cases where I will, well, I will implement this quite frequently. Um, in fact, uh, um, in most pyometras, unless they come in super stable and like barely ill, um, they're on fluids up until I can induce them for surgery. You know, um, usually the other, other surgeries lined up anyway ahead of them, and so if they're stable and they can, then what's wrong with, 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 uh, with um, stabilizing them further with fluid therapy, you know, rehydrating them. But otherwise, just to be clear again, these are sort of the parameter that you would, you would view is like, okay, maybe this, maybe this patient is one that can be a candidate for medical management. Again, not ideal for spaying them, but just so you're aware of it. Yes. Yeah, so what are the chances of reoccurring? I'm gonna actually have it in other slides as well, yeah. There, there's, there's two parameters that they look into in terms of medical management success. One is um, uh, uh, how often um, or how long after medical therapy will it recur? And secondly is can you, can you, breed, can you breed her again? Those are, those are, and I guess the third would be if you do breed her, what are the chances of having viable uh, puppies afterwards? Those are the parameters we'll use for, um, for, for success. But yeah, we'll go over in, in, in the next few slides. Um, I actually, I also have proceedings for these notes too that I haven't uploaded yet, but that my um, notes are very detailed for that as well. So you can actually look at what drugs individually and in combination um, have been used in the literature and what the outcomes have, have been. Um, so when don't you want to perform medical management uh, if you were forced into that you know, sort of decision? If they've got evidence of peritonitis, they're febrile, or they have a low body temperature, closed pyometra, and they have other diseases associated with the, with the uh, urogenital tract. So um, those are cases where you know, probably surgery is the way to go and medical management is not, is not ideal. Again, surgery is ideal for all of them, but in case you're faced with this, with this decision. So here's your, your answers, uh, part of your answers to the medical management. Uh, we won't go through too, too much detail with this, but basically the papers go into uh, using specific medications, what the success rate is for it, what the chances of breeding, what the chances of recurring. And you know, the numbers are not horrible. I mean, there's a wide range and, and these papers, um, there's a lot of variation because everybody's using different doses and different ways of administrating, administrating these, these drugs. Um, so there's, there's gonna be a high amount of, of variation, but. It's not, not, not horrible. Um, and probably this also speaks to choosing the appropriate cases for medical management, you know. So complications of medical management, I mean, and, and this is all common sense stuff, right? So uh, uterine rupture, or they, they can't um, breed or well in the future, they risk peritonitis or septicemia, it just doesn't work and it recurs. 
of surgery is the ideal, and of course you want to stabilize them. Um, the, the patients that uh, come in that are that are fairly unstable, you would try and stabilize them the way you would any other case, whether you're talking about a GDV or a hemoabdomen. You know, it's the same the same uh, idea here. You're monitoring the cardiovascular parameters, the body temperature. You've got your minimum minimum database, so chem CBC, and then you've got cat catheter and release one and revulsing fluids and colloids as needed. And you know, if they're anemic, you know, are they anemic enough, anemic enough for a blood transfusion? Things like that. Are they are they coagulopathic? So all the things you would do if you're trying to figure this out for the, to tell the client sort of what the prognosis is going to be, how much work's involved to try to save this dog. You're going to be doing the same the same uh, diagnostics as you would any other critical case. I will say though, at least in my experience with pyometras, they can look really bad preoperatively, and then after surgery, they can look markedly better. I mean, they're just it's just it's a whole it's just so different. So um, unlike a hemoabdomen, they may have all these issues with it. Plus, you're like, and it's probably hemangio. You know that that sort of changes the 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 um, owner's. Um, uh, goals here, what they want to do with these, it's like, boy, if I can just stabilize this dog as much as possible and get that uterus out, they usually have a pretty pretty good turnaround with postoperatively. So, um, we won't go into too much detail about all the different ways of spaying a dog. That's what the that's what the slide is for. Obviously, most of us, I presume, are performing your ventral midline um, ciliotomy. Has anybody else cut pyometras in any other way other than a, yeah. I mean, so, so, you know, but uh, this is just to be thorough. There's many ways of spaying a dog and um, some pretty fancy ways, but uh, you know, here's an example of a laparoscopic image of a, of a spay, but you're going to be doing your, your routine laparotomy, expose the, uh, the tissues there, and, and then from there a routine spay, whatever that means to you, but that's, that's, the, that's the goal here. Um, I um, always offer to the clients culturing the pus that's in there, and um, as well as I also offer them biopsying the, the entire um, urogenital tract there. Um, so both ovaries, the uterine horns, and the uh, uterus, um, and then usually the, the spay ends at the level of the cervix. All that's going to the lab. That can be quite pricey for folks, you know? And um, if, uh, if I have a dog that's maybe older, or there's multiple you know, cysts or something on the ovaries, or, I'm, I'm, or maybe suspected a tumor, or there's something in the uterine body that's a tumor or whatever concerning, then I push more for it. But you know, if I have to sacrifice the biopsy and cultures and put the finances towards saving the dog's life, obviously the surgery is the focus just to be clear. But if you have a pet owner that finances aren't an issue and they want to be thorough, yeah, culture the, the pus in there, biopsy the whole thing. I think most labs, at least my experience, will charge us as like three different biopsy sites too. So it's not just like one, one specimen, it's three, because it's both ovaries and the, and the rest. So just be aware of that. But um, if they are able to, um, yeah, I would, I would submit that for, for further evaluation. Most uh, folks, uh, I, I presume, spay with suture, is that right? Is there, yeah, does anybody use any other Devices, the ligature, mm -hmm. yeah. The ligature. Well, so these are a variety of different um, hemo, hemo uh, uh, static devices. But for me, by far, I mean the the ligature is, is the way to go, man. I, I love this thing. Um, I use it for anything with a pedicle, splenectomies. I've done dog neuters with this. Like it's it's uh, you know face valve airway surgery. These are great. Cholecystectomies. Um, Liver lobectomies, adrenalectomies are fantastic. Nephrectomies, so these are just they're just so good. It's so fast, so clean. But um, you've got a bunch of different devices that you could use at your disposal if you if you wanted to invest the the funds in it. They're really really good for for spaying and, and the, or anything with vascular surgery. And if, especially if you're trying to save um, time on the procedure, if they're a critical patient, this just saves you so much time. So I'm a huge fan of ligature. I don't know where they're at in the market now, but just a yeah, huge, huge fan of them. So just, a, just thought I'd mention that there. Um, when you look at the complications of, this is, these are basically the complications of a spay. So, if, you know, because a pine meter, pretty much at some point, is just a glorified spay. So these are all the, the, the issues that you can look, that you can find in the literature. There are many, many more than this. This is just a handful of them that I thought I would just, I would just go over. And, and I'm not even sure, you know, if, if if folks really use um, like braided suture much anymore for these types of surgeries, so maybe maybe even these complications are outdated. But um, you know, I'm sure that urethral sphincter mechanism incompetence is, a, is still a common one. Ovarian remnant syndrome. Oh, and, and by by the way, to talk about this for a minute, a little bit longer. Um, um, when I've helped general practitioners with spades, they're always terrified of that fat, large dog 
with a spay. And so I'm surprised how many don't either have an assistant scrubbed in with them to at least hold the abdomen open or hold or move the organs to one side while you're trying to find that ovary or just buy Balfour retractors. Self-retraining Balfour retractors are huge, huge. And a retractor like that will replace an assistant and, um, and give you way more confidence in performing that spay but the goal can't be the incision, you know, you, know, you have to have an, an incision uh, in order to do this as well, because you want to make sure that you, that you can, that you can um, remove all the tissue, obviously. So this is, this is, this lot, when I have seen these, it's always a result of a general practitioner trying to perform a big dog spay with a tiny incision, and I'm sure that whole day was just struggling and sweating and cursing to get that spay and just terrified of what's going on, and it just doesn't have to be that way. Longer incision, Balfour retractors, Grab an assistant if you need to, get the organs out of the way, and then just and then just go at it each each pedicle. So, um, do, do people here use Balfours? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just the way to go. And of course, you can you can buy different sizes, you know. But most of the time, these are these problematic patients are the big ones. So you're gonna buy either a medium or a large Balfour, and that that'll that'll help you out with it. So I think well worth it. And of course, you can use it for other abdominal exploratories, right? All the foreign bodies, all the biopsies you're gonna perform, intra-abdominal procedures like that. So um, yeah, just keep that in mind. Um, incision issues, peritonitis, you know. Oh yeah, here's yeah the the Balfour retractors. Yep, yeah. So the whole tying off of the ureters, you know, why even make that a risk factor? Just expose everything so you can do this procedure well enough. I'm not sure really clients care about how long the incision is. I'm not sure they're caring about the cosmetics of it, and the patient's incision is going to heal heal the side to side anyway. So what's the point of having a small incision and struggling and being concerned? You might as well just do it, do it as, as well as you can. And then hemorrhage is a problem too, right, with a big dog. So again, when I see hemorrhage postoperatively, I'm usually seeing it as a complication from a spay or from a pyometra because the ligature, the, uh, the, the pedicles weren't ligated sufficiently enough, probably because of lack of exposure. Um, the literature has a ton of information on prognostic factors. And uh, most of the stuff is, you know, non-clinical. It's always biomarkers, and they're looking at different different chemicals in the body to try and figure out what dictates um, prognosis. A lot of these systemic diseases are like this, and you know, um, we're not going to go through all those. Uh, I'll, I'll have those notes available, but but there's a there's a whole host of factors, um, and they're all obvious stuff. You know, if a dog should, you know presents to you in a in a coma, those have a worse prognosis than the ones that don't, right? It's <laughs> It's not, you know, but the, but the literature will go through it just to confirm that, that our suspicion is, is, uh, is true with that. So these are all uh, just different factors, and there's way more, there's way more. Um, overall mortality, zero to 27%. Euthanasia rate, 10 to 12, we run rupture. If the rupture occurs, 50% mortality. Um, the, my only time that I've seen rupture is intra-op, is from rough handling of the, of the, the tissue. I, I have yet to have one where somebody palpated the abdomen too hard preoperatively. I don't even know if that happens. Do you guys see uterine rupture with pios? Yeah, I'm not even sure that even happens, but that's always like what's, you know, what, what people are worried about. Um, and, I, and they certainly don't present to me with a, with a, a uterine rupture just because of disease progression. Um, I don't see it that way. Um, the incidence of sepsis with closed pyometras is higher, as you suspect, compared to open pyometras, but um, I'm not really sure I've noticed a big difference either in my experience with open or closed. It's not even a, a thought to me. It's just, uh, all it is just the closed ones make it a little bit more difficult to diagnose, but a little bit more, and that's it. That's, there's not much else that I, that I, I, I do with that information. So key points with pyometra. Um, keep in mind, this is the actual official name currently in the literature, so that's, that's what you call it. The last estrus, estrus is seen about eight weeks prior, PUPD, in, in addition to the estrus duration in intact female dog. Surgery is curative, again, you can consider culture and biopsy. Um, factors to consider, we've talked about Balfour's. Post-op care, which we actually talked a little bit on too, is that it'll be the same parameters of monitoring as I would with any sort of critical abdominal procedure like a hemoabdomen or a GDB. So blood pressures and ECGs, TPRs, post-operatively, you're gonna check all that. If you do think they were septic prior, then, then uh, things like wearing gloves when you handle the patient, right? Um, so we don't, we don't spread anything to them. Those are obvious factors. And then broad spectrum uh, antibiotics, also for these, for these pets. Usually I'm doing unison injectable until they can handle oral drugs and it's like clavamox from there. Um, I'm gonna go broad spectrum, probably unison and metronidazole to have the anaerobic coverage. But uh, um, 
but post-operative care should be as you know aggressive as you see fit for that patient or whatever you have in your at your disposal in your facility. If they came in with anatemia, I'm going to recheck the uh, chemistry panel within one to two days after surgery to see if that anatemia is resolved. White counts are always a, 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 a interesting topic. Um, uh, the literature does talk about whether or not high or low white counts matter, whatever. You know, uh, you don't have to have a high white count with a pyometra. They could be normal or they could even have low white counts. And that's probably due to all the white blood cells being in the uterus and not in the bloodstream. So it's just translocation, really. So I, I wouldn't uh, rule out a pyometra because they have all the other symptoms of it, but there's no leukocytosis. That wouldn't be a defining factor for me. I always just assume that all the white blood cells are just in the uterus and not in the bloodstream. So, especially in septic patients too, you'll, you'll see that as, as, a, as a hallmark sign of sepsis. What do you do about all those patients that have mammary gland tumors concurrently? You know, um, I've done plenty of emergency pyometras and, and either doing a local um, uh, like nodulectomy or a radical mastectomy. I've done them for these pets. That's, uh, that's me, I just, I'm very fast with these procedures. Obviously the priority is removing the uterus, that's the goal. So if you do have to find mammary gland tumors at the same time as the pyometra diagnosis, it warrants a conversation with the client just, just letting them know. Benign or malignant, we don't know, but this, this, this uterus has to come out and this may be where we just remove the uterus now and then deal with the mammary glands later once the dog is systemically better. There's no need for an emergency radical mastectomy, um, uh, so, but you will find mammary gland tumors with these dogs as well, you know, the older ones, you know, have chronic estrogen influence. So um, that warrants a conversation with the owner whether or not it's, it's worth tackling those at the same time as the, as the pyometra. Um, this may be a silly question, but if you don't have like injectable basal splenol, like a hospitalization facility, um, is Convenia strong enough to, to use some of our special reference until they can handle something like that or not? Yeah, so the question is, um, can, can I consider Convenia if I don't have other injectable meds? Um, so, so yes, you can use it. Um, it's definitely not going to be as broad spectrum as as you want it to be, right. uh, you know. Um, and of course, it's going to be a subcutaneous injection, which will be slower absorption into the into the vascular space. So, is it ideal? No, but better than nothing. Sure, okay. yeah, you know. Okay. But I'm also a bit different as far as surgeons go. I'm like, yeah, whatever works, sure. just do it, do the things. Um, you could consider something like, you know, because if you gave Convenia, it's probably going to be a faster faster um, absorption rate than an oral medication, you could maybe do something like Convenia, and then maybe a day or two later when the dog is uh, able to ingest things orally, then give them cloud mocks from there. Is that bad for bacterial resistance? Yeah, probably, you know, <laughs> sure. But uh, you know, you're trying to do the best you can for, yeah. for, for the, because I assume that scenario is maybe somebody who just, they can't afford to go to ER or a surgeon or whatever. Yeah. But well, you guys, we're often using like the basil and intra as mm -hmm. well, so mm -hmm. like, I didn't know if it was Sure. Easy. Good, I'd say good enough, like in those types of situations. Yeah, 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 that, that's true. Yeah, in, in your stable run of the mill pyometras, which is it's a healthy dog otherwise, no other abnormalities in the blood work. Yeah, so, so, yeah, cephazolin so perioperatively and then post op convenia or cephalexin orally. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, you, you want to have some antibiotic coverage, probably. Probably. I mean, again, it's one of those things where, really, with, with all the talks of, of bacterial resistance, do you really need it? Like, if there was, if the patient is systemically not ill and there was no contamination during surgery, and the source of your infection now is gone, do you really need antibiotics beyond like the first 24 to 48 hours? I don't know, maybe. I don't know. You know, but uh, um, it's, it's it's expected at least that we're going to give it, but that's not the answer. You know, is it appropriate? I don't. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah. And then prioritization of client finances. So the point of this relates to the you know, culture and biopsy thing. You put the client's finances towards saving that animal's life. That's the priority. Whatever we gotta do to get that, get that spade done. Um, at the end of the day, if the patient will have the same level of need of analgesics like a spade would. So it's not, they're not gonna be on a fentanyl CRI for three days post-op, right? It's gonna be the same sort of recovery from a pain perspective. So whatever you can do to get, so whatever you can do to get that patient into surgery and then get them home, great. If you can't do a metastatic screening for radiographs preoperatively, if you can't check blood pressures, if you can't do the culture and biopsy, if you can't check the azotemia post-op, fine. Just, it all requires client communication. Just letting them know, ideally, Here's the Cadillac of stuff we would do. Uh, you're telling me you only have this much, so let's just do the surgery and fingers crossed and see what happens. And with these dogs, it's really great because chances are the pie feels much better anyway, you know? But just client communication is obviously gonna be key. That being said, you can always do like, you know, maybe staging stuff later, let's say, like if you were able to, 
hold the specimens for some time, or um, if, the, if, the, if the owner can uh, form their three view chest rads like a month later that you want to do pre-op, sure, you know, I mean, you can stage later, but the, the goal here is to save the animal's life, obviously, and everything else is sort of nice to have, but not, not required. My contact information and um, any other any other questions regarding Pyometra or anything else you want to ask? I actually <laughs> yes. have one more question. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, um, go for it. So in this wonderful pers like procedure itself, I mean, we've done a number of them, but there's always the question of over sewing the uterine stump mm -hmm. and how you're handling ha handling that piece. Like, do you just flush it and leave it? Do you actually, you know, over sew? Like, what do you do? I'm just yeah. curious. So, so when you when you've done enough of these, you notice that you know where you want to transect here for the uh, the pedicle is going to be this huge meaty mess, right? And um, and you you can you you're, you're, you you put your hemostats or maybe caramels on there, and it barely even closes because it's so thick and gross. But you you it's only you can only go so distal on the stump to for these dogs. So what I've typically done for them is treat them almost like like a gastrotomy. So I'll do a two layer closure for them. It'll be um, a, um, like a simple continuous, just appositional pattern. And then, and then if I can, an inverting pattern after that, like a gastrotomy. And then what I will do, if the omentum for that dog can reach that caudal uh, without, you know, not tearing the omentum, just starting to see does it reach, then I actually will omentalize the stump as well. So I'll, I'll put maybe two or three sutures, omentum to stump on top of the two layer uh, closure and uh, and you're, you're, you're good to go. That's the, the one problem with ligature or any other cautery device is that it, 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 if they're so thick sometimes these stumps that you can't even get the ligature to clamp on it. And then when you do finally turn the ligature on and you know the, the, the thermal explosion that occurs, the thing that the stump just, ex, just explodes. I've done it and, it's, and then it retracts cautery and I have to find it in the pelvic inlet when that sucks. That's, that's less than ideal. So in those same cases, I actually won't reassure those. I'll use my clamps just to, just to create those, um, those tread marks and then use that to, to suture it. So I'll do like a transfixation suture um, um, bilaterally and then the, the stump itself, the cut surface, will be two layer closure. Simple continuous inverting and then omentum, if it can, if it can reach, I'll suture omentum to, the, to it. But even when I haven't done that, um, you know, as long as you get like a decent closure, um, I haven't seen any like septic admins post op for those cases either, but uh, those are some added measures you can do for those really thick and gross stumps. Yeah. yeah. And you know nothing wrong again with like if you're again it is going to be like really big dogs and very vascular. Um, each of the, the uterine vessels on both sides of the stump there, you can just you know you can ligate, ligate those separately. You don't have to incorporate those into your stump. You can ligate each vessel separately. Um, cut it. See, you're good. Okay, do the next one. Cut it. Okay, good. And then deal, and then deal with the stump, and uh, and mess around with that that mess. So, any other questions? Okay. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.